It's always a delight to be with you. This is home for me and uh, your family. And it's always nice to see new faces as well uh, here. So praise the Lord. And for those watching uh, by live stream, wish you were here. Um, it would be wonderful to see your face right here today, but I'm glad that you're joining with us. And uh, let's just have a great time. Amen. All right. I am truly, truly happy to be here today. <laughs> we'll see if you feel that way by the end. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I wonder if the story of Jesus Christ could have more meaning or hold more meaning than what I typically attribute to it right? Jesus died for me. He took my sins. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And that is awesome, right? That's great. But is that all there is? Is that all there is? When this life is over, right? Glory, glory, I'm going to fly away. We used to sing that one a long time ago. That's, that's showing you my age. <laughs> you know, we have a hope that comforts us in such a troubled world, don't we? In that which is to come, the hereafter. In focusing on the hereafter, on that which is to come, I wonder, I just wonder, if we have unwittingly diminished our faith to escapism. Well, let's start off with a bang, right, this morning. <laughs> is it possible that the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has greater implications for our lives here and now and for our world. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I hope by the end that you're all saying yes and amen. And to find out, we're going to start with the story of humanity. We're going to go back in time. For those who want to know, the message is called Triumph Through Tragedy. So God created Adam and Eve with a specific purpose, to worship God and exercise dominion, authority, and responsibility in God's created world. We read that in Genesis chapter 1. And the Garden of Eden is where God walked with Adam and Eve. It was the place where the realm of God heaven and the realm of earth the realm of man intersected and overlapped heaven on earth and god always intended for us to be in the very center of what he was doing we were meant to be a part of the action oh by your faces you look so excited <laughs> we get to be a part of the action and created as God's image bearers, humanity was designed to worship God and to reflect his image, his plans, his love into this world. But something went horribly wrong, right? God's image bearers chose to worship something other than the one true God. Knowledge, power, self, ambition. And what happens when God's image bearers no longer reflect his glory? What happens? They miss the mark in fulfilling their God-given purpose. They hand over their authority to the idols that they worship. Their image becomes corrupted by sin. A <laughs> feel-good message so far, right? <laughs> And all of creation suffers because God's image bearers chose to worship something other than creator God. And so the principalities and powers that are at work behind the false idols, the non-gods, if you wish, use the power that's been given them to wreak havoc on humanity and all of creation. And today we see that one's man worship of self, of power, of greed, is re wreaking havoc on Ukraine. And I get reports. I was in Ukraine in 2016, met beautiful people there. 
and the tragedy of what is happening there is because God's image bearers chose to worship something other than God himself. And so evil has entered and is wreaking havoc and destruction because the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And on that day that Adam and Eve relinquished their authority to the enemy, God promised that the day would come when he would crush the enemy's head, breaking the power of sin and idolatry. Hallelujah. That was in Genesis. And within this story of humanity, we find the story of Israel and the covenant of blessing that through them all nations would be blessed. It would be through them that the promised deliverer would come. And a world that was given over to idols of all shapes and sizes, right? The Israelites were to set themselves apart to worship the one true God. And through them, God would reveal himself to all nations. However, <laughs> however, the scripture tells us the Israelites repeatedly enslaved themselves to idols. Right? I mean, you look throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, what was the issue? Idolatry over and over and over, giving themselves over to the false gods, giving themselves over to idolatry. And it unleashed the forces of evil that wreaked havoc on them, ending in oppression and exile. Sin will always lead us into exile and oppression. And in desperation, we see the cycle over and over again. They would cry out to God. They would turn their hearts to God in desperation and ask and cry out for deliverance. And God would raise up a deliverer and they would be brought into freedom. And the Israelites held on to this promise from God in the scripture that a Messiah, a Savior would come who would once and for all take his place as king. And they interpreted God's promise as a militant warrior that would come and overthrow the government of their day. And God's promise came in a way that no one could have imagined or expected, and it didn't make sense. I think sometimes that happens in our own lives, doesn't it? We take God's promises and interpret them in a way that it doesn't end up that way. <laughs> but God's promises are sure. And so the story of Jesus is the story of Israel and the human race. As the Messiah, he represented the Israelites. And as a human being, he represented the whole human race. So the promise was not just for the Israelites, but for all, for all for whosoever will. And as God, he represented self-giving divine love. Philippians, this is where we're going to be for a little bit of time. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. I hear no pages, no pages turning, right? It's all on your phones and computers, right? <laughs> and I don't have the PowerPoint for you today. Ha! <laughs> Philippians 2, 6 to verse 11. Who? and we're speaking of Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Right? God coming down, <laughs> coming down, coming down, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And something pivotal happened here. Something happened in this moment. Something 
changed even death on a cross. This wasn't something new, death on a cross. Crucifixion wasn't new in the time of Jesus. It was well known. But something about the death of Jesus Christ on his cross was different. And we see a shift, verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we see in these first few verses that Jesus refused to operate in the way that normal worldly powers do. They wanted a militant warrior who would overthrow the government. And I think we still find that sometimes within the Christian circles, don't we? We want somebody to overthrow the government. <laughs> but that is not the way of Jesus. <laughs> He did something different. <laughs> he who was Lord of all became a servant. This is where people won't like the message, right? <laughs> he who was all powerful became weak. He became human. He who was equal with God refused to take advantage of his status. Out your amen. You see, at the center of Jesus' triumphant story is the cross. <laughs> Triumph in tragedy. Triumph through tragedy. It's not a story we would write. It's not a story we would come up with to convince the world that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> I mean, the Romans perfected the torture of crucifixion. It was the worst and most brutal kind of death. And this was at the center of Jesus' triumphant story, the cross. <laughs> the Romans used it to put fear in the hearts of their subjects as a deterrent against uprisings. Would-be messiahs would be crucified over and over again to prove that they were nothing. And Jesus' moment of greatest glory, the glory of God's justice against evil is revealed most profoundly in the glory of God's love demonstrated on the cross. Glory and suffering. Triumph and tragedy. The self-giving divine love displayed with outstretched arms. This is not an angry God. This is not an angry God. This is the self-giving divine love of God. When your child is hurt by someone, bullied by someone, when something comes against your child, does your anger rise up against your child? It rises up against the force that is coming against your child. The wrath of God is not against you and I. It is against the evil forces that have come against us to destroy us. And so we need to put aside this idea of an angry God, who's, someone who's angry at us. Amen. <laughs> his love, his love. And no one could have imagined that the way to triumph would be through tragedy and suffering. And we hear a lot of apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and these, glory, 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 glory. And no suffering to prove that glory. Just a thought. <laughs> Glory and suffering are inseparable. And his death was the point of greatest glory because in that moment, he defeated the power of sin. 
It was the pivotal moment in history. It was the day that everything changed. And as Israel's representative and all humanity's representative, sharing death, bearing sin, he removed the weight of sin and death. The Messiah, as the living and dying embodiment of God himself, accomplished the forgiveness of sins. That's powerful. Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. By the cross. When a new king would come into power, what would he do? He would have the outgoing powers stripped of their authority, paraded before the people for all to see. So how does forgiveness of sin result in victory over power? It's a mystery, isn't it? But think about it. Where do idols get their power from? Where do evil forces get their power from? Because we have sinned. We have given over that power. But by dealing with sin, idols lose their power. Because we've turned again to worship the one true God. Mm. If you were looking for hype today, I'm not giving it. <laughs> I want to give the word. <laughs> By dealing with sin, idols, evil powers, evil forces lose their power. And his resurrection was proof that sin was defeated and even the last enemy, death, could not hold him. It was swallowed up in victory. Philippians 2, 9 to 11, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, earth, and under earth, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is King. Jesus is King, and his kingdom has been inaugurated. His rule has begun and will continue to expand until the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, he is king, he is in charge. It's the kingdom now and the kingdom coming. So what does that mean for us in our world today? Jesus came to reconcile everything together in him both in heaven and on earth. In him, the realm of God, heaven, and the realm of man, earth, meet and intersect. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. God loves the earth. God has not turned his back on the earth or the people. Amen? The Garden of Eden was the original place of heaven and earth interconnecting. Adam and Eve walked with God, fellowshiped, and enjoyed each other's presence. And after the garden disaster, because there's no other way to call it, the tabernacle, the temple became the meeting place of heaven and earth, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God's presence dwelt. And then Jesus came, and he tabernacled. He dwelt. He walked among us. Heaven and earth met in Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us. And when Christ died, what happened to the veil? in the Holy of Holies. It was rent in two, opening up the way for all to come to the presence of God. Hmm. And through him, 
a new humanity is created. We are new creations born of his spirit. Ephesians 2, 15 to 22 says his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. And the two here are Jews and Gentiles. There is no division. There is nothing to separate us. Thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. It's about Jesus. <laughs> All right. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Corporately, corporately, we are his body together, you and me. <laughs> and we are being built up as his temple where the realm of heaven and the realm of earth meet. In Ephesians 2, 6, we're told that we have been raised up with him and are now seated with him in the heavenly places. We experience the realm of God and the realm of earth intersecting and the presence of God is with us. The body of Christ is powerful. It is the place where God's presence manifests through us, earth and heaven meeting. I think we need a new focus, a new vision of the body of Christ. Yes, in the earth today and what we bring and what we should bring. In Christ, we are a new humanity in which his spirit dwells. He's given us a new heart. Hallelujah for that. And as his image bearers, we become the living proof of God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that shifts a few things. He didn't overthrow governments. He overthrew sin and created a new humanity with a new DNA. And the reason history is doomed to repeat itself over and over, it's not because we don't learn from history. It's because the DNA of man is the same. Desiring idolatry, desiring power, desiring ambition, desiring self. And so we get all astonished that this thing could be happening in Ukraine. Why are we astonished? Man has not changed. Mm. And that's why Jesus had to defeat the power of sin and idolatry so we could get a new heart, a new DNA, be restored to worshiping the one true God and be his image bearers in this earth. And each time someone gives their life to God, the power of sin is broken in their lives. They become a part of the new humanity and the kingdom of God expands. I'm not just awaiting glory, glory to fly away. I'm not just awaiting for the hope to come. My eye is not just fixed on the hereafter. We have something to do here today. We have a difference to make in this earth today. We are part of God's plan and action in this world today. We have purpose. We have purpose. Hmm. And Jesus, 
<laughs> set out the pattern of life that is both the foundation and the model for the way this new humanity ought to behave in relation to one another, in relation to the earth, in relation to all people. This is where it gets good, people. <laughs> right? Jesus is the model of the new humanity he created. He's the model of how we should live. Hallelujah. Philippians 2, 1 to 5. Remember, Jesus did not do things the way the worldly powers did. And so the way of the new humanity is not as this world. Philippians 2, 1 to 5. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. <laughs> love one another. Work together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests. But take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, Lord. I mean, in the time of Christ, I mean, even today, this, it just doesn't fly with the world. But in the time of Christ, this, this was revolutionary. A shared life of community, mutual love and partnership in spirit, heartfelt affection, sympathy. The same attitude as Christ, although the Lord became servant, although all-powerful became weak, although God refused to take advantage of his status for his own gain, he did not operate like the powers of the world. And it's in this shared life of community that the ways of the kingdom are demonstrated as evidence to the world that Jesus really is who he said he is, and that he was sent by the Father. They will know you are Christians by your love for one another. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I have to confess, <laughs> I am not so great at community life. I'm not. There is so much work that the Holy Spirit has to do in me, right? I don't, I mess, community life is messy. It's messy because there are humans involved. <laughs> it's not easy. And what I'm, I'm speaking of, what, what Christ demonstrated, you know, in an ideal world would be perfect. But we're not in a perfect world. And the Apostle Paul had to speak to the jealousies, the divisions, the problems in the church. But this is our purpose. This is what we are to look like. This is what we should be reaching for. Amen. Amen. And if we understand that the community of Christ is the demonstration of a new humanity, under the reign of King Jesus, where the realm of heaven and the realm of earth meet and the presence of God is manifested, maybe, just maybe, it will help us shift in understanding the purpose of why we gather, why we're here, and maybe it will help us shift away from coming just to fulfill personal needs. You love me? <laughs> You have to. <laughs> you don't have to like me, but. <laughs> and becoming part of something greater together. If we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives the same attitude as Christ, then truly the light will shine in the darkness of this world. And the church will do what it's meant to do. Oh, it's not easy. 
Wow. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Yep. Matthew 5 to 7 is what his rule looks like. The rule of God is found in Matthew 5 to 7. It's his manifesto. This is kingdom life. It's not about seizing power or control. That does not change hearts and it doesn't change societies. He tells us the Beatitudes just for a little taste, right? <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when we refuse to retaliate, when we give instead of taking, when we speak truth instead of deceiving, when we honor instead of insulting, when we forgive instead of withholding, we demonstrate the rule and realm of God on earth as it is in heaven. When we give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, we operate under the new administration. This is how our king behaves. What of spiritual gifts? When someone is healed or touched in some way through the gifts and operations of the Holy Spirit, it is a manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It is a manifestation of Jesus as king. He is in charge. And those gifts, <laughs> let me just go on a little rabbit trail, okay? <laughs> those gifts should never, never point to me. They should never be mine. They should never be a self-pointing marketing tool. They should always point to the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ as king. I'll leave it there. Oh, hallelujah. Creation groans for the manifestation of the sons, the image bearers of God, because they demonstrate the rule of God and his administration, and through them the glory of God covers the earth and all of creation benefits. The Bible says, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. How will that happen? Through us. Through us. Mm. Christ's rule is not only some far off future event. It's already been inaugurated, and we get to be a part of its ever-expanding influence now as well as its completion in the future. What a privilege, what an honor. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, under earth, every tongue confess, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He is risen, he is risen indeed, and the story continues through us. The story of Jesus Christ continues through us because the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the spirit that dwells in us. And we have been restored to worship him and be his image bearers in this earth today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is awesome. And you have a purpose today. You, you may not know what gift. 
You may not know what office. You may not know what label. It doesn't matter. You are called to be his image bearer. And the best way to do that, be kind, be merciful, be Jesus on earth. Do as the king does. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, (laughs) you have done great things. You have called us and made us to be in your image, to reflect your glory to be lights shining in the darkness of this world. And I pray that you would, as your spirit rises up in us, teach us, teach us how to be your image bearer. And when we fail, pick us up, dust us off, and send us back in, Father. Help us to learn what it is to be your body in this earth. Help us to learn what it is to demonstrate community, to demonstrate your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Teach us your ways, God, and use us to the glory of your name, that King Jesus would be lifted up, and as he's lifted up, all men would be drawn to him. Thank you for giving us new hearts, a new DNA. Thank you for breaking the power of sin in our lives so that we can worship you in freedom and be who you intended us to be. Partners working alongside you to reflect your image, your glory, your plans, and your love into this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus.